Thanks very much for all the new faces for coming out. To, uh, this is our monthly event called Tech Tuesday, as you would probably well know. And <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. And we've got a, an interesting agenda for you this evening. There's a lot of people involved, and luckily again for you, not me. So I am merely going to introduce our MC for this evening and let them kick it off. Thank you for your patience. It's uh, 6.30 and eight companies are going to convince these fine gentlemen up here that they deserve at this point to go forward. But I'll let Nick explain all those details for you and moderate things from here. So thanks again everybody for coming. Good luck to all the competitors, the contestants. I wish you all the best of luck. And I'd like to introduce Nick Quain, who's the VP of Venture. Or Venture. 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 That's a good name. Good name. Yeah. <laughs> VP of uh, Ventures. All right. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the evening. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so just to give you a bit of the a bit of context on what this pitch event uh, is all about. Um, on June 11th, uh, Accelerate Ought is taking place here in Ottawa at the NAC. How many people have tickets to Accelerate Ought already? Well, those of you who don't, okay, yeah, you get clap first, clap first. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. For those of you who don't, I get killed by my marketing team, and, and Lucy's already staring holes in me if I didn't mention the fact that at midnight, the price goes up, so it's $99 for founders, entrepreneurs, members of early stage companies, so get your tickets tonight when you get home, don't forget. Um, but at June 11th, it's going to be an amazing event. We've got a, a, a ton of high-profile speakers coming in, from Mark Roberge, former uh, Chief Revenue Officer of HubSpot, Chris Ye, who, who co-wrote uh, Blitz Scaling with Reid Hoffman. We've got our Ottawa's very own Mike Wider doing a fireside chat with Debbie Weinstein talking about his third exit and his exits that came before that. We've got a panel on building a scaling company in Canada with people like Jason Flick and, and many others. And then it culminates in the penultimate event, which is a hundred, it's the biggest pitch event in the history of Ottawa. We have Panache Ventures has agreed to put up $150,000 minimum that they're going to invest in one of the companies that day. And you can see David Adderley's jealous. He's not too late for Celtic House or Mars IAF or Angels to, um, to get in the game, as it were. Um, so going to be a great event where uh, between six and seven companies, we're not sure the number yet, will pitch at that event. And in order to get into that event, there were two pitch-in events. So one is this evening and one was April 4th where a bunch of worthy companies, and as soon as I can tell you that, that unlike some other pitch events, this one has brought out some amazing companies. So as soon as you put up a number like $150,000 that starts to become a lead, as part, a lead or part of either a pre-seed or a seed round, we, as you will see, we have some amazing companies here. So it's really excited, and we've been able to pull in a number of great investors. So um, in terms of our, our uh, panelists, so we have uh, Nick Jacques Bouchard from Panache Ventures, we have Lance Laking from Mars IF, David Adderley from Celtic House, and Mike Gagnon, who is an uh, angel partner with Panache Ventures, but also a member of, of Capital Angel Network as well. So the four of them are going to be asking some questions. It's a, uh, I'll jump ahead to the rules, it's a five minute pitch with a four minute Q&A. So there's a timer up here. I'm gonna tackle the founder if they get to 501, so it'll end. It, it could be a couple of violent endings to, the, uh, to, to some of the pitches, uh, but they have a timer up there they'll be able to see, and then there's a four minute Q&A. At the end of that four minute Q&A, we'll cycle it through, and we're gonna run through it really quick, and it's gonna go really quick with, with all eight companies um, pitching in relatively short order. At the end, uh, we are not going, the, the VCs are not going to declare a winner because they're going to retreat and consult with us to figure out amongst the first cohort who should be the final six companies uh, or seven that pitch at Accelerate Odd. But what we are going to have is an audience vote at that time. So at the end of the, all of the pitches, a QR code, you probably sat on one or you saw it before you sat down and lifted it up. Some of you don't be embarrassed to look under your butt right now. That's probably what, what's there right now. Um, there's a QR code. They'll also be up on the screen. If you're an Android phone, I think you'll have to enter the um, actual URL that's on that sheet. If you're Apple, you can just uh, point your camera at it and it'll recognize it. And you get to vote on who you think was the best pitch, the most worthy. And uh, it's, it's somewhat symbolic. We're from Invest Ottawa's prototype lab. We're gonna build a big, beautiful stainless steel, uh, for the winner, we're gonna build a big, beautiful stainless steel version of their logo. And if you see this thing, it doesn't sound like much, but once you see it, it's beautiful. 
it would it would survive in Armageddon. It will outlast all of us, probably the company. Um, it's really quite awesome, and and that's not saying it will last all of us and the company included. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so without further ado, we're going to get going. So let the pitching begin. Are my official timers ready? They are. They're giving me the head nod. So first up is Dev from Blue Wave. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, going back to my baseball days, um, you know, when you bat leadoff, um, the pitchers are, uh, they have the most energy and, uh, and, and, and you got to perform a bit higher. Just so everyone knows, I've already pitched, David was the first VC I went to see, he told me no. Uh, Lance, <laughs> Lance was not the first, but maybe the 50th I went to see and he also told me no. So I'm back here. Um, 49 guys in between, and then we see where we go from here, right? So, uh, so basically, uh, uh, we're, we're in a tech park fill, filled with propeller heads, and most of our parents have, like, no clue what we do. Uh, yeah, we program, like, some ones and zeros, and magic happens, and guys get, like, good jobs, and some guys get, like, really rich. Finally, I'm working in a company where I can kind of tell my mom what, what we do, um, and basically, Smoke spews out of like coal fire furnaces and you know electricity generation that's carbon burning. And what we do is we make wind and solar smarter with software. Roughly speaking, at night when the wind, at night there's no solar, during no wind, there's no wind farm energy. And so you backfill it with coal because you can't predict all this stuff and you can't optimize how the system works. So we do some black magic over at Blue Wave AI uh, to give our customers who are utilities and energy, custom, uh, uh, energy providers 5 to 20% savings. And our goal, um, what we're implementing now, is to make the hardware smarter. So if I stop going backwards, so quick facts about the company. We do all this black magic software, addressing a $4.2 billion TAM. We've got five signed customers, and uh, your black magic is only good if someone's willing to pay for it, and we have people paying for it. So that's a good thing. Uh, moving the other way, four US patents filed, four more to come, signed a $2.4 million term sheet with the Canadian Clean Tech Fund, hopefully to close very soon this month. Uh, a massive team uh, that gives me heartache because I see them burning through a ton of capital every day, so I have to go to guys like David to beg to them to give me money to pay all these guys to have a big exit. And we were in the top 100 of global clean tech startups this year. Um, so, uh, roughly what do we do? Uh, imagine this is the city of Ottawa over here, and this is like a transmission grid, and this is like utility scale generation of energy. And, and, and you see like these dirty black smokestack oriented things and these beautiful green things. And our goal is to displace as much utilization of that stuff. We, we have this software that basically connects up to sensors in the city or in the large industrial campus. And we monitor all the data that's coming at us. And uh, just like a self-driving car, we predict, optimize, and make decisions on all the data that's coming at us by something that's similar to sensor, sensor fusion in a, in a Tesla. And uh, then away you go, and that's when the savings happen. And at the end of the day, we make the renewable energy smarter. Okay, so if I can get to my customers, these are the guys who we have signed up in three continents, from India to North America to Europe, uh, generating revenue from some of them. $4.2 billion TAM, two categories of customers, distribution utilities. Guys like Hydro Ottawa or, or Stromnets in Berlin, they deliver the last wire electricity to the homes, the campuses, the industries. And then the other category is basically large industrial customers. Everyone's got a graph like this. Should I just skip it? Because everyone's going to derate it. But our, our plan is to make six... Uh, 66 million dollars of revenue in five years through the two categories of customers. Typically a large enterprise, this is the check size for a customer on ARR, and this is the two million dollar, uh, uh, the large utilities, 750 to two million dollars. 
Um, and this is what we're doing now. We, we did a pre-seed round of 1.3 million. Um, we got a seed round in progress and the number looks like really big because someone at Cycle Capital told me to tie in my clean tech grant and uh, have the number look bigger. Um, it is there also because that's what we operationally need to get to a Series A. Um, we're raising 4.1 million now, 700K is open. And uh, that's where we want to exit to, to the hyperscale guys and so forth. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Deb. I think I've heard the questions from all these guys. Thanks for the presentation. Yeah. No, you don't hear me. Uh, Not yours. Can you, yeah, exactly, that's what they don't, they don't talk. Uh, can you walk me through the sales cycle, how long it is? And yeah, it's like way too long, uh, yeah. and, and we gotta make it shorter. Um, no, seriously, we're selling to like utilities and energy guys, right? So you're sitting here as a VC going, man, I don't wanna put money in that company. They're tied to, to revenues like forever. So we said that we can't, we can go apply to the, a the same AI to the transmission grid and change how energy is utilized at a national scale. And then my angel investors will throw me under the bus right now instead of later and say you will never make money in time for, for not to die on the vine. So what we decided to do is address the distribution utility, which is smaller decision making at a city scale, um, address the, the industrial ca campus customer who have a tighter decision making. Um, our time to revenue, so I'll give, it was 492 days from the first time, I, from my first customer to when I converted them to revenue. And that include a large proving cycle and all of that, them ignoring emails for eight months until they finally got sick of me. Uh, so subtract eight months from when I got in the door. Um, having said that, um, up front, what we do is we work with the customer's historical data to develop AI models to see what they could have done if they operated differently with an AI optimized approach and we set a benchmark that takes several weeks. After that, we turn on their live sensors into our stack and we don't touch anything. We just tell them now, based on your live data and these models, this is what's gonna happen in your utility and at Summerside PEI, this quarter, we're gonna turn on reoccurring revenue. They're soaking and seeing the results right now. Um, so that was a 492 minus the eight months. So subtract 320 from that. So six months, like, uh, approximately 180 days from when we first engaged to, man, there's a penny in my bank account. Um, Six months, uh, you know, if we can do six months all the time, it'll be really good. I don't think it's gonna be six all the time. So just to be realistic, it's like six to 12. That's so, just being honest. So how are you gonna shorten it? How am I gonna shorten it? So um, way back on the first slide, there was a, a set of patents. I didn't get into all of the black magic behind them, but the black magic behind them is basically saying, if you know how to drive your car in Ottawa, I'm gonna dump you in New York City, David, and you're gonna drive in New York City out of your driving skills in Ottawa, but you've already developed your AI models for driving. You're not learning how to drive again in New York City. Then I take you and I put you in Mumbai, and you're gonna drive in Mumbai, right, and Shanghai. You know how to drive, you got the AI models for driving, you get exposed to new data at a new location. It's called Warm Start. And the idea with that patent, and we're, 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 you know, we're evolving it, is to actually warm start AI models from location to location to location, so we don't have this you know, from the ground up. And you know, in a perfect world, um, we would like to shorten it uh, well beyond six, three to six months. One reality is uh, we're, we're dealing with, uh, uh, with customers with uh, magic number March 31st, anyone recognize it here in Canada? Government year ends, utility year ends. And so we need to a priori get into the budgeting cycle. Uh, and, and we've done that at, at, at two of the utilities here in Canada already. And that's part of the gig. And once you're in and you're sticky and the reoccurring revenue's happening, then someone booting you out has to go through the same thing uh, to, you know, going back to my background in the chip industry, once your chip is in Huawei's base station, you know, in their 5G base stations, it's going to ship forever, right? Um, so. Perfect. Thanks, Dev. And for Dev.
And you see we, we threw out some extra hurdles there, like the funky buttons are kind of reversed, so it's an extra test of the entrepreneur's ability to multitask in a new environment. Here's someone ready for it, I think. Oh, look, you, you, you got more time. You got more time, Dev, look at that. All right, next up is Joe from Cybernetic. Hi, my name is Joe, I'm from Cybernetic. Uh, I am a professional hacker, first and foremost, so heads up, your phones are not okay. <laughs> Everything else though is totally okay. Um, I started off my career uh, working outside of Canada as an offensive cyber operator. I came back in 2010 and I became deputy director of the National SCADA Test Lab where we designed some really funky tools. Uh, don't kick that. And then from there, we actually started to take those tools and bring them out into the community where we actually grew them as an entrepreneur in residence at Carleton University. I had a lot of fun, built a great team. And then from that point forward, I actually started to actually build and commercialize and productize the technology all to where I am today with IO and actually growing my team successfully. I'll tell you something right now from the front lines. Cybersecurity is a huge challenge. We are behind the eight ball here in Canada. There is a massive storm on the front. There's $14 billion in cybersecurity activities alone in Canada. One in five Canadians will be impacted alone this year. There is a shortage of security professionals. There's not nearly enough Joe Cumminses of the world to go around. And on top of it, there's increased complexity. Not to mention there's a deferred line between all the technologies inside of your environment. Cyber attacks are the number one threat to your business today. On top of it, we have organizations right now that have 73 billion in IoT as of 2015. And if there was a country for cybersecurity threats, they would actually have the 13th largest GDP of the world. That's nuts. So I believe that seeing is believing. If you can't see your, your adversary, you can't fight your adversary. This is a log file from an existing tool inside of an organization that we work with. That's the flaw in that file. Can you find it? I know I couldn't find it. That's what it looks like inside of our technology. This is a, an existing vulnerability file. This is a firewall configuration file. I know nobody right now that can walk through those files and actually find you the holes. We require technologies to do these things. Inside of our technology, I can actually see with confidence what your cybersecurity posture looks like. I can tell you where the attackers are gonna come from and you can actually solve it yourself. I take juniors and I make them seniors overnight. This is the tool in use by myself. I'm actually using the tool for the first time. I'm actually going to walk through in real time what an organization's cybersecurity posture looks like. This is an actual organization. It's, a, it's an airport authority. They have a large scale of amount of information and they make sure that every one of us gets from our destination back to the next destination without any time being interfered with. But they have live, in living color, threats to their system. On average, it's 1.5 million per day per hit inside of their organization. That's ludicrous. I can see what's going on and I can actually color code all the different events and actually show an organization what types of activities are hitting them and how. But we care about money right now, so let's just do that instead. So inside of an organization, I've got strategic partnerships. I'm working with these large vendors to actually bring our technology to market. I have a $76 million near-term market here in Canada alone. I actually have a model where I need at least five cybersecurity experts of our level or higher and a 1.5 OPEX. I have a total addressable market right now, just a little bit shy of $231.94 billion by 2022 and 11% uh, compounded annual growth rate. On top of that, my go-to-market strategy is actually to own those relationships. I work with each one of my organizations that we sell customer, uh, that we sell claw into. That's my constituency. I work with those organizations. On top of it, we have a pricing model that's based off of per node. I'm not gonna charge you a uh, all-you-can-eat buffet model. I want every node in your environment to be secure, so much so that I actually priced it out. And our, oh, that's the, uh, that's the American version or the American special well, pronunciation of professional services. <laughs> and then of course, uh, we have an OEM pricing model and a whitelisting pricing model. We've got some Americans in the room right now, respect. Hey, it's all right. So right now we have uh, 450 committed and I have a $2.5 million forecast. 
On top of that, we have exposure through some of our major customers that we're looking to actually live demo the technology to. I also have a number of organizations that we've identified needs. We have actually been able to work with them directly and see exactly how the technology would stack up with all their other cybersecurity investments. And then on top of it, I have procurement and contracting with these organizations today unfolding. And we're seeing revenue hopefully through the door within the next couple of days. Seven seconds, is that right? That's right. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Close it up. Yeah. Right there. I'm all done. Good job, Joe. Okay. Who's got the Rotten Tomatoes? Lance has got the Rotten Tomatoes. I knew it. Yes, sir. So, so you identify a threat. Yeah. And they pay you some money for that. Well, one would hope, yeah. How, how, how is it that an enterprise will keep paying you money, and what do you keep doing to you know, demonstrate enduring ongoing value? That's a great question. Every piece of their cybersecurity investment is constantly shifting. It's not static, it's a dynamic network. You've got new devices coming online, you've got older devices going offline, people are coming and going. There's so much porousness to their environment. They need to constantly maintain that check. What we've called resilience as a service model is our ability to come in sight unseen, work with their information, what they have already, and then progressively step them towards reducing that overall cybersecurity risk, discovering optimization, and being able to reduce the overall cybersecurity investment so that they can actually see what their network looks like and anticipate the threats from where they're coming from. So that's exactly, that's a great question. Do you need to be involved for the onboarding? Do I need to? Do, yeah. We're actually training other people to take away that responsibility from me, but yes. How long it is? Pardon me? How long it is? How long is it? Yeah. Typically in onboarding takes about five minutes to stand up the tool, about another 50 minutes to point all the different security investments that they've done, their firewalls, their sims, their splunks at the technology. And then the training for their juniors is usually two days. Seniors are usually the ones that push me out of the way because they know how to drive stick and they're like, get out of the way. I want to play with the Ferrari. Uh, went through some of the slides. Went pretty quickly, so I, yeah, it might have been on. The, man. Yeah, it may have been on the, some of the slides. So who's the who's the buyer here? Who's your typical buying persona, and what is your av average? I know your early stage, but what do you think your sales traversal time is with these uh, buyers? So who's buying? How, how does long? their decision making work, and and how long? So I'll answer the second question first, then go back to the first one. So uh, the typical deal size is roughly around the 150 to 250K mark. Uh, that just based off of their rust rough estimates of how MRR big, MRR? that's MRR. So we can actually see how big their networks are. That's a larger enterprise sale. Uh, OEMs for like Bell, Telus, Rogers, they're millions and above. So they're fairly large. Uh, deals, uh, the deal time, organizations in the private sector, We've seen as little as six weeks. Uh, public sector, uh, public safety, I think we're going on two years. So, uh, but again, government right now, Canadian government's not buying cybersecurity. So we typically focus on the private sector alone. Our buying persona, uh, we look at organizations who have individuals that are five people and above for their cybersecurity team. And usually one of those individuals is what we call a CISO, Chief Information Security Officer, or a Chief Information Officer. They're the persona that we look for. They're well-educated, they're fluent on their cybersecurity investments, and they're able to actually specify what they have and what they don't have. We can optimize what they already show, and if there's weaknesses or deficiencies in what they don't have, we can fill in that gap for them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect. What's the onboarding like for your vertical partners? Uh, Organizations that have an existing MSS play, or uh, sorry, a managed security service, I'm throwing a lot of acronyms right now, they have the ability to spool up fairly quickly. The managed detection response folk, they need to get a bit more training, but they already have the fluency in different technologies. We just make better use of that data and we can actually make it clearer as a picture. Most technologies in the cybersecurity world are what we call tell tools. This plus this is bad, this plus this is good. We actually show you what the network looks like. Oh, sorry. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. I, know, uh, I now know what my line is when I see Joe in the accelerator space. 
every day I'm going to see him, I'm going to say, there's not enough Joe Cummins in the world. <laughs> I'm going to say it a lot more dramatically. They just hug it up. <laughs> Can't scale that, baby. Uh, Thank you, Joe Cummins. All right, next up, Andrew from Fanshare. Good evening, everybody. My name is Andrew Rutherford, and I'm the founder and CEO at Fanshare Sports. We are a media and analytics platform for daily fantasy sports players and sports bettors. Now, I was first introduced to fantasy sports at about eight years old by my grandfather. We used to sit at his kitchen table <laughs> and add up box scores in the Ottawa Citizen, recalculating his fantasy baseball team scores from the night before. He never trusted the newspaper was tracking it properly. Well, fast forward 30 years, and while the kitchen table's a mainstay, fantasy sports has evolved from pencils and paper into a multi-billion dollar online industry. Just by a quick show of hands, how many people entered a March Madness pool this year? All right, so a handful of you. Hopefully you picked Virginia. So it turns out you're not alone. Uh, Americans wagered eight and a half billion dollars on March Madness this year alone. As you may be aware, sports betting was officially legalized in the state of New Jersey about a year ago. And by 2020, it's expected that up to half of all US states will legalize sports betting. The American Gaming Association estimates the total size of this market at $150 billion. So this is all very exciting. But fantasy sports players and sports bettors are plagued by a serious problem. Too much information, not enough time to consume it. Today's day and age of information overload, there's huge volumes of news, stats, trends, content sources. It's become impossible to keep on top of it all. That is, until now. About three years ago, I left my successful career behind as a forensic accountant and started Fanshare Sports. At Fanshare, we put press, precious time back in your day by curating the best and most relevant content relating to fantasy sports and betting into a centralized news feed. Next, using name entity recognition and machine learning technology, we're able to break down huge volumes of data into bite-sized trends. Meaning Fanshare is the only place where you can see the big picture in a single dashboard. Or as we like to say, it's smart data for winning lineups. That's not just a fancy tagline. The model actually works, as evidenced by the continued growth in our user base. In fact, we've had almost 13,000 people sign up for our free service, with over 1,000 of those going on to purchase a premium subscription. In 2018, it cost us a little over $7 to acquire a paying subscriber who would return $60 in average revenue. We had total revenues of around 60,000 US in 2018, and we're on pace to more than double that in 2019. Not only are people signing up and paying for our service, but they genuinely love it. And our customers are the biggest ambassadors of our brand. Organic endorsement on social media has been a huge driver of growth up until this point. But why? What is it that people love about our product so much? And how are we differentiating ourselves in this hugely competitive space? Well, simply put, it's data you cannot find anywhere else. By aggregating player buzz and sentiment, we arm our customers with the data they need to differentiate and gain leverage on the crowd. Who amongst us honestly believe Tiger Woods would win another Masters? Just another example of the crowd not always being right. We all wanted it to happen, let's admit. Not only are individual consumers buying our product, but it's also been endorsed by the biggest players in the space, including DraftKings, the current leader in the US sports betting market. We're raising a seed round of $500,000 at a $2.5 million valuation, and with those funds, we plan to invest heavily in our technology and marketing. More specifically, over the next 18 months, we plan on scaling in to multiple more verticals and sports on the backbone of our machine learning technology. We'll adopt the same strategy that's worked for us up until this point, just more aggressively. Hopefully we'll have some money to spend. So just to recap, we're going after a $150 billion market opportunity with a product that's been validated and widely adopted across our target industry. 
We've got highly valued partnerships and we're building cutting edge technology that will serve as our engine to scale. We've also got a highly motivated and competent team who's positioned to succeed. Thanks very much and happy to take any questions. Really great presentation. Um, can you walk me through the differentiation between the free model and the paying models? Yeah, so we're actually leaning towards just scrapping the free model altogether. Uh, the free model is essentially, a, it's the centralized news feed, so you can quickly kind of browse who's trending. You can get all your content sources in one place. It's actually a great tool, and I think if we were able to scale it and get more active users, you know, we could introduce some ad revenue into that. The paid model is all the tools, the, the heavy data, the dashboards, the, the screenshot you saw of the, the iMac. Um, that's where people are going in, they're digging into the data, they're, they're using those tools to set their lineups and make their bets. What's the price right now? So it ranges from, it's about $10 US a week up to $30 a month for NFL, $20, uh, 25 US a month for PGA. We're only two sports, so uh, we'd obviously like to scale into the rest of them. Okay, one of the uh, differentiators you talked about, because this is a pretty crowded um, yeah. space, is uh, the data feeds. Can you talk about that a bit? You said you had some unique data feeds and yeah, unique so, data. So we've built, uh, you know, it's still a prototype, but we've built a model that essentially scrapes our Twitter feed and brings in all these sources. So we're bringing in tweets, articles, podcasts, and then the technology will actually digest that and pull out the, the the player tags, so it'll tag every time a player is mentioned, so it's tracking their buzz level, and then it's also uh, assigning a sentiment score, and why that's so valuable is for game theory, so like you can't win in fantasy sports or even betting if you just pick, you know, who all the touts tell you to pick or who the rest of the world is picking, right? You have to find your, uh, your edge, really, uh, a little bit like investing, right? The, the biggest gains are on the other side of the trade often, so. So on the predictive analytics side, did you pick Tiger as there? Did you get, <laughs> did you get the Kentucky Derby this year? Did you, uh, that sort of thing? Or? Well, let me put it this way. Um, we didn't pick Tiger, but we told you that nobody else was. So what about a rev share? Have you thought about that instead of maybe a monthly subscription and a kicker that this winner is going to be glad to do a rev share? Yeah, we're... We've thought about that in the past. It, it, we're a little hesitant to commit to that because at the end of the day, you know, this is about entertainment. People love to win, um, but you know, we're also like our own users are competing against each other at the end of the day. So we can't make the same guarantees to all of them. Um, you know, we get lots of testimonials, people winning you know, up to $100,000 using our data and that's great, but it is, let's be honest, the exception. So we do rev shares with lots of partners um, so tons of promo codes and podcasters are our biggest uh, uh, marketing tools. So, you know, those have been great and very successful. What's the, uh, the next sequence of the three next sports? So NBA is definitely next for us. It yeah. uh, presents a bigger challenge because it's a true daily sport. So it's, you know, nonstop and we need to make sure our technology is, uh, is good enough to handle that real time uh, data feed, right? It's just every day, new content and, um, so definitely NBA, I mean, it's, it's a massive and growing global sport. Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA, is a big proponent of legalized sports betting. Um, so, you know, that's definitely next on the list. Uh, probably UFC, uh, soccer, obviously, with the, the global market as well, so. That's great. Awesome, thanks, Andrew. <laughs> next up, Tyler Nelson from GoFor. Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Tyler. Um, so go for it. We provide last minute, last mile logistics solutions for the construction industry. We do that by operating a logistics marketplace. That marketplace brings together merchants and distributors of construction materials. Some of them have fleets of vehicles, some of them don't have fleets of vehicles. We're bringing them together with owner operators and small fleet logistics partners that we onboard to our marketplace. And through the marketplace, we transact deliveries, um, which we call transactions. Inside transactions are multiple deliveries, and we execute those for our merchant partners. What we do for our merchant partners is the value in our business. 
So we become their last minute, last mile delivery partner for urgent and, and, uh, and short response deliveries. Uh, we are their logistics partners for scheduled next day, long haul and short haul deliveries. And we also become their fleet partner to provide specialized vehicles like boom trucks, roll on, roll off, Moffat trucks and others that they traditionally don't have access to except through specialty providers. Well, we grew up in Ottawa, we're an Invest Ottawa company where I met the company as a growth coach. Uh, we're now active in six major urban markets in Canada. And this month we're launching our first three US markets, uh, Charlotte, Tampa and Dallas. Um, our business, really, the, the technology platform is a platform as a service that provides instant quotes, transparent pricing, easy order entry, uh, along with real-time tracking, proof of delivery, and most importantly, reporting and governance. Our merchant partners value the fact that we deliver them, uh, provide a new capability that they don't have in their business today, which is last mile delivery. They get to never say no to a customer, and we federate all their long-term, long-tail logistics providers into one platform. Our crowdsource partners, our crowdsource logistics partners and small fleet partners, we actually just make them more money. We provide more revenue opportunity, we make them more money every day, and we pay weekly. For our merchant partners, we save them money. For our logistics partners, we make them more money. Our merchants come in two flavors, those with fleets and those without fleets. Those with fleets typically have some common problems. They have low capacity utilization of their own vehicles, very high operating costs, and even with their own fleets, they still have a challenge because of how their days operate to provide on-time, unscheduled deliveries and same-day deliveries. They also still have to deal with downtime for vehicles and fleets because of sick drivers and downtime vehicles. Our merchants without fleets rely on third-party couriers. Those third-party third -party couriers are really difficult to manage. They're very expensive. It's a long-tail market with no or low-tech reporting. Uh, it's largely an uncontrolled cost center for them. It's also fraught with kickbacks and, uh, and it's a very difficult cost center as a corporation to manage, as you'll see in a moment. You know, we spend a lot of time with our merchant partners. Uh, we live in their shoes. We understand their business problems every day. And this is a nugget recently from the Vice President of Logistics for PPG. He's got a big problem because he oversees logistics for an entire corporation with a lot of locations. He's got a bigger problem because that spend annually on third-party logistics is $180 million US, and he can't control it. He doesn't understand where he's spending the money or how he's spending the money. We can save him money. We look at our merchant network in a pretty logical way through a four-quadrant matrix that overlays our capabilities in the network with our merchant partners that are in four quadrants, paint and interior decorating stores, home improvement stores like Home Depot, which we claim now as a customer, uh, roofing and siding companies like KCAN and Roofmart, and specialty distributors of uh, building products in the HVAC, electrical, and plumbing sectors. We make money today by transaction rev share in our marketplace, essentially taking a share of every transaction or delivery through the marketplace. We also have today reporting and governance uh, solutions as a SaaS tool, and we're building uh, dispatch as a service capabilities, which we roll out later in the year, both of which will carry service fees in a SaaS model. Both markets are large, they're just unexplainably large. Uh, those are real numbers, I can ground them. Brad and I look at, uh, at, at our, the, really the next two slides are how we ground or how we think we're actually meeting the market and our MVP is having fit. And this really shows we got 660 markets, 660 merchants, 70% are revenue active any, any given month. We generate really strong revenue per transaction and our merchants, once they start using us, continue to use us. We're uh, growing fast, 1,700% growth in the last 12 months, 120K revenue in the last month, 2,300 transactions and deliveries. Uh, we are an IO company. Uh, we raised one seed, two seed. We're now on seed three. This number's a little wrong. We're about 2.3 with still 200K of open with, venture, uh, with Semex Ventures, Mucker Capital, and I2BF already in the deal. Thank you. That was information dense. <laughs> Any questions? How easy is it for you to open a new city? Uh, so our, our, you know what, our cookbook is baked. Um, so we have a go launch process that essentially overlays our matrix of 
what merchants, what kind of dra uh, volume they drive, what type of volume they kind of uh, predict in terms of logistics capability, what the average revenue per transaction and the rev revenue share is, and we essentially get to cash flow break even with two bodies in each market, full-time bodies, and a launch team between four and six months. What's the uh, customer onboarding process on the merchant side? Like how long is it taking and how, how are you doing it? So it is a high touch model. Um, we deploy uh, partner success managers, salespeople essentially walk in, knock, in, uh, knock on doors in pre-qualified merchant meetings uh, that they generate through uh, outbound calling and uh, outbound email campaigns. Uh, typical onboarding meeting is 30 minutes. We think that investing to do that is really important. This is a high touch Last mile logistics in construction is a contact sport, full contact sport. So um, building those relationships on the ground, David, makes a lot of difference. And so we invest to do that. We've seen from Delivery and uh, Deliv and Rody and others who have come over the top with omni-channel last mile solutions. Their churn is super, super high and the lack the intimacy. So we're investing in intimacy. Where's your uh, your revenue right now? Your annual 120 K. So we're so we'll, we'll double revenue by September. We're 120K last month. We'll be 130 to 150 this month. And goal is 350 or so by September. Monthly? Yep. And how much have you spent to get there? Uh, well, I miss you. The you, you blew through the numbers pretty quickly. 1.5. One, one, 1. Okay. What's the take up in the SaaS? Like a percentage of customers uh, actually so paying for the we're, SaaS? We're in the debate with our friends at. at uh, uh, Mucker and Semex and I2BF right now, um, we're ready to monetize today. Um, we, could, we, we know we've tested price points of $185 a month for our governance and reporting package called Go4 Pro, mm -hmm. which would allow a Sherwin-Williams store or Home Depot with hundreds of locations to consolidate in a parent-child hierarchy the way that they manage, control, alert all of their spend at each location. And we're being waved off pretty violently waved off monetizing right now. The view is that this is a real stickiness play. The information is addictive. Let's give them the information. Let's not charge for it now. And let's come back when we have 5,000 merchants and monetize it then. And I think I'm with them. Okay. And your average transaction is 52 bucks. What's the average? In rate? the last five days. Last month, it was 49 bucks. So we see a seasonal swing up because we, as we've moved from indoors. So my revenue concentration right now is Canada. Right, six markets that have all been through our winter. <laughs> and I've grown through the entire mess of this last six months. It's all been interior trades. So now that we're actually building on site and we're framing, so we're rolling specialty vehicles, those guys roll at an average revenue per transaction in excess of $150. So our art, our average revenue starts to climb. Yeah, good stuff. Um, G 120. K is your GMV? What, what, we do not do what, GMV, so we so don't carry. Our model is simply right now in marketplace transactional. So, so I charge I charge the merchants for the transaction that's and the your delivery. Net. And, so, and so, you're so it's not my net. No, let's, let's be clear. That's then I share revenue, right? right. About fifty eight percent of that with okay. owner operators and small fleet. Okay. So your net is forty percent of that. Uh, fifty eight percent. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Tyler. Next up, Sebastian from Incaverse. Bonjour, uh, mesdames et messieurs. It is a véritable plaisir d'être parmi vous. Uh, my name is Sebastian Hajantono, and I am CEO and co-founder of Incuverse. I spent uh, six years doing a PhD at the University of Ottawa, growing and looking at cells. And these are two very different environments. When you grow them, they're in an incubator. When you look at them, they're on a microscope. But when you want to look at them as they grow, you end up with a very difficult and expensive problem. A problem that leads to something even much larger. Last year, in the United States alone, $8 billion was wasted on irreproducible cellular experiments. 50% of all the publications that go out are found to be irreproducible. This is because of the inherent variations in biology, the inconsistencies in the way they're acquiring that data. Incuverse is looking to change that. Our mission 
is to visualize, capture, and analyze every moment of cellular research. And to do this, we plan on revolutionizing the one piece of equipment that's used in every lab around the world, the incubator. And we call it IRIS, Incuverse's real-time imaging system. This system combines the microscope, the incubator, and cloud computing machine learning to provide the user, the researchers, with the ability to live visualize their data in real time. To give you an example of this, here's one of our customers. He goes onto the platform and he sees what he's currently doing in terms of experiments. We provide them with live analytics as to what those experiments are doing, key indicators of cell health, whether growing, doubling time, migration. And we give this directly to him. The power of Incuverse, however, lies when you start collecting this data around the world. Because at this point, we know what everyone is doing and that we can compare this data to give them real-time analytical feedback as to how far they're deviating from one another. No more are the times where you publish three years down the road it's for, for also much for someone to say, well, we didn't get your experiments or we didn't get your results. By the end of your experiments, you know exactly how far you're deviating from the norm. In addition to this, people upload their metadata, the reagents they're using for what they're doing in their experiments. These are all the various biotech companies selling their products. We leverage this metadata to then compare it to the success of their experiments. We then get quantifiable understanding and data of which reagents are best for which types of experiments. We then sell these products on our platform. And of course, as people upload that content, our platform becomes the YouTube of cellular exploration, providing copious amounts of library data for people to search and understand things they've never done before, not only on the researcher sides, but on the student side. The market is quite large. At 250,000 labs around the world, we're looking at a $2.5 billion hardware, but we're not just a hardware company. In fact, we really are a software company. But what we're really excited about is a new market segment that we are now recently creating. We've approached five universities in the US, and each one of them have been very much on board with integrating our systems into their undergraduate student labs, providing them with new tools and research capabilities they could never have before. And of course, the segments helping these opportunities are, well, we're all getting older, which is a good thing but your knees are breaking. Stem cell therapies are coming in and they're growing. In addition to that, of course, well, cancer research is also on the rise because we're living longer and it's, uh, it's becoming a problem. Cellular agriculture uh, is lab-grown meat and one thing that is really, uh, you know, a technology that could be potentially affecting any one of you is imagine a future when you're going into an in vitro fertilization clinic and, you know, normally you're supposed to do the procedure and you're told to go home. We'll call you in seven days. Well, what if we were to be able to give you the live visualization of your next child? We call it the, uh, the real life selfie. <laughs> so the current model, the hardware sells for just under $5,000 for specific procurement limits. But of course, we have a SaaS model, anywhere between $149 and $249 a month. This is on the short term. On the long term, we form partnerships with those biotech companies and sell those products on our platform. We have 35 beta users ready upon release. And of course, our five pilots projects are, uh, are to be launched in September. We also have a distribution company, our distribution uh, partnership with Thermo Scientific, which is the largest company in the world for medical devices. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. So, so, um, a software company eventually, but maybe the Trojan horse is hardware. You're absolutely right, yeah. Um, and so are you displacing a big, bad, expensive Goliath, or what does $5,000 look like to the world? It's a, great, it's a great question. So basic incubators that are, well, we, dis we describe them as dumb incubators that don't really do anything except hold temperature and CO2, those can range from anywhere between eight and 10,000. Anything with cell imaging, the kind of capabilities we're suggesting are anywhere between 50 and, 100, and 150,000. So those types of uh, Goliaths uh, depend on one institution buying one system shared with everyone. And in fact, recently, my marketing guy, uh, we, we, we found this entire list of all their customers, and we've been contacting their customers, emailing, saying, hey, 
are you guys sharing that, uh, that, uh, that system? They're like, yeah, we don't really like it, but we've got something for you. And so we're getting about a 40% reply rate on those. So the, 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 the issues are clear. Um, so we are not displacing a Goliath because what we're offering in terms of software and hardware doesn't exist yet, but there are very large players in the much more expensive fields. Who's producing the machine right now? At the moment, we are. Okay. Um, next generation system, Iris, will also be produced in, actually locally in Stittsville. So at the moment, we're all, we're all Canada owned, Canada assembled. Um, the reason for that, of course, as well as reiterations happen on a weekly basis, making sure everything is kind of streamlined. Uh, going to China at this point would be a terrible idea. Uh, it's very difficult even to get parts on a, on a consistent basis. So we've decided to stay local. And what's the producing time right now? The producing time? Yeah. Uh, it takes roughly about a week. Well, we get an order, we get the supplies, and we execute. Yeah. Cost to produce right now? Or the, uh, the next generation? Next year, we'll be under 2,000. So we sell it for, for five. So roughly about a 60% margin. And then, of course, our, our SaaS model is really where we come in. Would the SaaS be like a, a rental whereby you retain ownership? Uh, retain ownership of their data? Or no, of sorry. Which? The SaaS is an, a layer on. That's correct. Gotcha. It's an obligated layer on. So they could buy the unit, but then they wouldn't have the imaging. And, well, that doesn't seem to make much sense. Yeah. Um, it's early days, but what's the sales cycle like? Like uh, we've, at Celtic House, we have a company that was... Uh, an optics company, then it became a blood testing company, and now it's, uh, it's, it's Tino's company. It's still alive. It's called Cubella. Okay. And now it's like 20 years later, and I, they're just around the corner to getting, uh, getting the right approvals and uh, right. the FDA and getting out there. But it just always seems like an incredibly right. long and painful sales cycle, approval cycle, so et cetera. Two, uh, two answers to that. So we are a research purpose system only, so there's no FDA. So that's, thank you. And the other one, because we're under $5,000, again, the procurement limits, they can buy this at any point at any time during the year. So yes, there are favorable seasonal times of year because of course of budgetary concerns, uh, but they can purchase this at any time. So we don't have, we've chosen that model of obviously kind of like a, an iPhone model where you reduce the cost at front, but get it back in terms of long term through the SAS. And who's making the decision? Who's making the decision? How many levels do you have to go through? Uh, generally, it's, it can be up to two, but mostly one. So generally what we do is we go to the lab tech or the higher end, because the professor at this point, they don't really care much. They, you know, they just delegate. Uh, ultimately, again, under 5,000, the professors don't need those types of permissions. Um, but uh, it tends to be about a two-step two process. Awesome. Thanks, Seb. The downside of, uh, of, of them building it in Stittsville is all the bubble wrap at Invest Ottawa. It's, uh, there's a lot of bubble wrap there, although it is fun still to step on it and hear it pop. All right, next up, Mike from RVZ. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Canada's first ever RV sharing marketplace. What I want you to think is Airbnb for RVs. So I'm a police officer, and about three years ago, I was seriously injured on the job when I was attacked and assaulted in the line of duty. Uh, following surgery, I reached out to my buddy Will, a veteran uh, from Afghanistan, went out for a couple drinks about what to do on this time off and kind of talk through that injury. And we got into a pretty deep conversation about my motorhome that I owned and how I was renting it out and making money. My first year renting that motorhome, I purchased it for $16,000 and I made over 10 grand in the first six weeks. The problem is, didn't have any insurance, large cash transactions, and it's a very, very shady, unsafe way of doing it. Knew there had to be a better way. We look at the traditional way of renting an RV, so whether a motorhome or trailer, and what you're doing is you're going to the fleet companies, the big dealerships down the road, and you're paying ex exorbitant amounts of money, and it's really unattainable to your average Canadians. And these RVs are located in city centers and just not accessible to the rest of us. So our solution is a web-based and we're mobile first. We launched the first RV rental app in all of North America, arguably the world. And we're a safe, secure, so every transaction is safely processed through our website. 
We approve all the drivers. We approve uh, all the users, so including the owners and the RVs. Everyone is fully insured. And the biggest thing is the variety and affordability of the inventory. You're renting directly from a private owner, so you're saving at 30 to 40% from traditional rental options, and you can rent anything from an ancient Westphalia to a brand new motorhome. So we followed in the steps of Giants. So Intact provides the insurance for the Giants like Uber, we all know Uber, and Turo, the car sharing app, and we convinced them to build us the first ever RV sharing uh, policy in Canada. So what that means is that every, we hold on to that policy, it's exclusive to us. Anything processed through our website is covered by our commercial fleet policy and has no impact on the owner's full replacement value on their units. This is my favorite slide. The numbers do not lie. Our first year in business where we only got our insurance policy halfway through the year, we did over a half million dollars in, in revenue. 2017 to 2018, we ended the year, we put 1,200 RVs all across Canada onto the website. We did 3.8 million in revenue. This year, 2019, we're on track to do 15 million. We had our first million dollar month back in March and we're exploding. To put this into perspective, there's 2.1 million RVs registered in Canada. 5,000 RVs were really just scratching the surface. Now we talk about our acquisition costs and how, what does it cost? These are, again, some of my favorite numbers. It costs us $90 to acquire an RV owner on our site. That RV owner is gonna make us $500 in our pocket in the first year. That means that very first transaction, we recoup that acquisition cost. It's a big market. Canada alone, there was over 650,000 RV rentals in 2017. That's a $1 billion market in just the rentals in Canada alone. The RV industry in Canada, $12 billion. So what's next? Rapid expansion. It's a land grab here in Canada. We're going to expand and get as many owners on the site as we can. We're looking at similar, you've seen on Airbnb, where Airbnb stops, that's where we're gonna start. Our owners live in the destinations where people wanna go. So if you wanna provide the experience of a, a canoe trip, guided fishing, whatever it may be, you'll find it there. The average RVer will spend $200 a day while on their trip. Why not give it to us? So who's ready to go on their next RVZ adventure? Really impressive number. Uh, what's the revenue share between the owner and you right now? Uh, so we, we're a service fee based. So we, we take a 10% service fee from our renter, 15 from the owner, so 25%. But we've also found ways of uh, increasing the revenue. So we have a deductible buy down program and also roadside assistance that we handle in house that also generate revenue. Our gross margin ends up being around 19%. Got it. And what's the kind of license I need to drive RV? Is he on our live chat right now? That's where we get all the time. Yeah. You, there, there's no special license required. You have a G license, you can drive my 37-foot motorhome anywhere you'd like. <laughs> you don't want this. <laughs> it's insured, right? Yeah. On your uh, insurance policy, what's the, on the fleet, what's the experience been so far? Uh, it's been very, very good. Uh, obviously, our, our, our rates... We can operate very well with the rates that we're at, yeah. uh, but it's a very profitable account for Intact. We're actually going through negotiations right now, but very profitable. Our claim rate is under 1%. Uh, and generally, people on vacation, if they do damage something, it's, it's generally a fairly low value. They're not getting into big accidents, but the claim rate is very, very low. And the nice thing about the insurance you, you can't even get it on a personal policy. We provide full replacement value. So it's not the cost at the time of the, the collision. It's what will it cost to replace you with the same unit. So owners on our site are actually upgrading their insurance when it's rented. Wow, uh, great numbers. Uh, so congrats there. Thank you. Um, on on the, the supply side, I sort of see it as all sort of owner individual owners with their RVs, is there a, an opportunity for you to maybe knock off some of the, the, the 
chains or the, the in, you know, the commercial RV folks as part of your supply side? We, we, we've looked at it. We've experimented a little bit. They're very high maintenance. Their price point is usually 40, 50% higher than our average rental on the site. But what we are seeing is our owners turning into super owners. So the guy that made $20,000 last year on his motorhome has gone out and purchased another four. So he's buying his own fleet. They're a lot easier to manage. And we're actually looking at our, uh, a program where we will help finance the purchase of new RVs to our super owners. So really, we've groomed them. They understand the platform. They know how it works. Much easier to manage than the family-run dealership that's been doing it for 80 years and doesn't want to change the way they do things. What's the competitive landscape look like in the U.S.? Uh, so really, RV sharing kind of started back in the U.S., about 2012. Uh, it really took off in 2015. We have two large American competitors. One of them came to Canada about a year ago, and we're killing them, which is awesome. Uh, it's, it's always nice to beat the Silicon Valley guys. Um, but there's two major competitors in the U.S., and it, you can kind of look around globally, and it's really starting to spread. It's kind of the next phase in the sharing economy. There's still a lot of room for growth in the U.S. A lot of it is still open. Uh, you, we can easily have be the third competitor in the U.S. And you mentioned your uh, really great CAC numbers um, to LTV. Uh, what's your most uh, efficient way? What's been the best uh, way to spend your digital dollars to get customers? Uh, digital, for sure. But we have a pretty good marketing mix. We attend all the trade shows, so boots on the ground at the trade shows. Great way to, to interact with the customers. Facebook is probably our number one for owner acquisition. Uh, Google for, for our renter. Um, and we're also really started expanding our channels uh, through Kijiji, use.ca. We did a pilot project with AutoTrader. Uh, there's a lot of different channels that we've been able to bring in our owners. And it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of spillover to get the renters. Um, but what happens is that we bring the owners to the site, and then we have a sales process where if they do not list their RV, they're followed up by the sales team, and they're onboarded that way. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Next up, we have Amir from Smats. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Amir Goss, and I'm the CEO and, and founder of Smats Traffic Solutions. We provide intelligent solutions to better monitor uh, traffic congestion uh, for roadways. So traffic congestion is a big problem. So we all hate sitting in traffic. Basically, last year in the United States, $87 billion was wasted due to the congestion and the, the loss in productivity. People of uh, New York, they spend 82 minutes uh, every day uh, commuting. Uh, so these are crazy numbers. So what's the solution? Is it the autonomous cars are going to solve the problem or using uh, uh, more Uber drivers? Actually, no, it's going to be the same issue, so none of this is going to help us. What we are looking for is actually uh, a traffic management solution. So the traffic management system uh, basically use existing uh, use technologies to detect traffic, to monitor the uh, congestion in real time, and actually use the, this information to uh, change the traffic flow and use the existing infrastructure more efficiently. So it's a huge market, there's an $80 million, billion dollar, uh, market by 2022, and there are a lot of uh, use cases that uh, traffic congestion can help uh, for roads and cities and for port and rail yards and border crossing. Uh, these are the cases that we have uh, issues with the lost revenue uh, for movement of goods. So the legacy systems such as loop detectors, uh, traffic cameras are becoming very costly and uh, difficult to maintain. And it's uh, still unbelievable that people use uh, roadside surveys to find the uh, trip, origin, and destination of the cars. Uh, what we provide is uh, we engineered uh, an IoT sensor. Uh, it's a roadside sensor that uh, pick up uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi signals uh, from existing sources. These are coming from uh, your cell phone, your um, uh, uh, car em embedded system, car audio system, and hands-free devices that are, are, in, are in the device and we can track the cars as they move along the road and it's a very non-intrusive non way of detecting uh, traffic. Uh, we also use third-party data, uh, crowdsourcing data, like a Google API, to get our, our data source and we use uh, machine learning and AI uh, in our analytic engine to provide uh, uh, 
the status of traffic in real time, including travel time, uh, queue lengths, and uh, origin destination information of the trips, and use that, that data to optimize the signals and reduce the traffic in real time. Uh, so a few competitors, uh, they use a similar technology. Uh, we have a, a better detection rate in terms of sample size, and we have adjustable detection zones that uh, allowed us to use uh, uh, advanced analytics uh, using uh, machine learning and AI uh, to optimize the traffic in, uh, in real time and uh, use advanced filtering uh, uh, data, data cleaning and uh, algorithms. So uh, we have sell the hardware uh, uh, upfront cost. Uh, we have 65% margin on that. And uh, we, has a, we have a SaaS model uh, that the, the customer use our web analytics uh, and API uh, to use the, uh, the data uh, for uh, congestion monitoring. And that's 540% uh, uh, per, uh, per year. And we also charge for professional services uh, for integration, uh, maintenance and support, as well as uh, extended warranty. So we have sold our uh, sensors and solutions to uh, nine countries so far, 16 clients. And we get those clients through uh, organic code requests uh, through our website, attending by trade shows and also uh, by outreaching sales. So these are our major clients uh, right now. The city of Minneapolis are using our sensors for uh, traffic monitoring uh, and the city in, in China and Indonesia. We have paid pilots with the port of Doha Riviere for uh, monitoring uh, truck congestion at the port and also a pilot with the Ministry of Transportation Ontario in Toronto. Uh, we spent the first two years uh, validating our system and also uh, successfully finished our pilots. And now uh, we are, have a very uh, enriched uh, sales funnel uh, that uh, give us uh, around 700,000 uh, sales revenue in 2019 based on the prediction of the Q1. We have a very small team right now. Uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, including myself, uh, Steve Brown is our business development with uh, more than 30 years uh, of sales experience. And we have an engineering team and also a marketing assistant. And we have advisors from West Ottawa and the academia. So the reason to invest is that uh, we have a proven market traction. And we have successfully finished our pilots uh, with customers' testimonials. And we have a very rapidly growing pipeline. And uh, there is no uh, big player in the market that stops us uh, from winning more businesses. And we are looking for a 500,000 seeds round. Thank you. Since you're selling to cities, how long is the sales cycle right now? Uh, for the cities, uh, uh, when we sell to the customers uh, outside of Canada, usually, usually the you know, uh, distributor system integrators approach us. They usually find us through the website, and there are already RFP going on, and that takes around three months for us. For the uh, cities in Canada, we actually uh, uh, doing our pilot with MTO, so we are creating awareness uh, for the cities in Canada, and we are watching for RFPs, but for uh, smaller sales, like smaller cities, they want just want four sensors, uh, and the, the cap budget is 25,000 without RFP. We also leverage that. And I imagine they're starting with a pilot, so how many convert to a paying model to actually stay with the technology? So basically, uh, the, uh, all of the clients that, they, that we have right now, they start with Pilot, and actually they, start, they, they kept using the sensors afterward. Um, what's your, what are you modeling for average revenue per, per customer? So we are working in our sales funnel, we have uh, deals that they are uh, half a billion and one million dollar, one million dollar uh, uh, actually sales that uh, includes 500 sensors, 1,000 sensors, but the biggest sales that we have had so far is $150,000 for one customer in Minneapolis. With such a small team, how are you delivering professional services globally? So we are a second tier uh, support, so basically our uh, partners and the system integrators, uh, they do the first tier and on-site support, and we do the, the second tier support back here. So follow on then, how are you training the partners? We do the Skype training. We, we, we train the, uh, the, the sensor side, uh, how to maintain it, how to uh, do some small fixes if, uh, if it's possible. And also the web platform is just, a, we have a tutorial and an online, online training for them. 
what value do the uh, your four or five customers see in the product? Like, is it is it just reducing congestion? Do they have KPIs internally at Minneapolis or these other customers that you have? Like, what's driving them to to adopt the technology? Yes. So the, the, the first actually motivation is KPIs. They are they are measuring what's going on in real time, and uh, they also uh, we are also have a signal optimization uh, platform for them in a pilot mode that we are testing with the uh, city of Mississauga and also uh, Minister of Transport. Uh, for the port, it's a still a pilot project. For them, it's more about uh, basically congestion monitoring and how they actually change their the pickup uh, route and pickup locations and drop-off locations at the port. Awesome. Thank you, Amir. Thank you, Amir. And last, but certainly not least, Adam from Wave Boating. All right. Good evening. My name is Adam Allure, and I'm the founder and CEO of Wave Boating. Thank you for your time tonight. Uh, so what is the problem we're solving at Wave? For the recreational boater, there is a fear of damage from what lies below the water surface and this can overshadow the fun of boating. And now this fear is justified when you consider 2.5 million propellers are replaced every year in the United States due to running aground damages. Now, the solution to that problem is nautical chart data. Unfortunately, the way it's typically presented leaves a lot to be desired. It's cluttered, difficult to interpret, and as a result, captains are left with that feeling of fear. Secondly, there's no single solution to common questions when on the water. I need gas. Where can I get it? Where can I safely moor for the night? What are the great sights and attractions? And for many people, where are my friends? <laughs> the solution is the Wave Boating mobile app. Finally, captains have the freedom to have fun. And we're solving these problems with two unique feature sets, intuitive nautical charts and community collaboration. Let's dive deeper into both. Boaters buy boats to have fun. And that fun stops when they go to read a nautical chart. They have to consider where they are, interpret the depth of the water, factor in their draft, i.e. how far it protrudes into the water, and calculate whether or not they are at risk. With wave boating, there are no calculations. We intuitively show boaters where they can go in blue and where they cannot go in red based on the draft of their vessel. And it's this intuitive danger avoidance that allows them to just jump in their boats and go. Regarding community collaboration, there's so much on the water knowledge, but it's in everyone's heads. This industry needs a proper crowdsourcing platform, and that's what we provide. We allow boaters to share their experiences with map pins and also the routes that they've taken safely, and they get validated by the community. Lastly, if any of you have tried to meet up with someone on the water, it can be a particular pain, especially if they don't know where north is, there isn't street signs, uh, landmarks all kind of look the same, blue rock, green trees. We've solved that problem by building a Find My Friends-like functionality within the app. So boaters can build their own fleets of friends so they can easily connect and communicate. Now I'll give you a quick comparison of our product versus one of our competitors. Here you've got the Kingston Waterfront, which is where our office is located, with a custom draft profile, showing a boater where they cannot go in red. I've seen this. You can hand this to a brand new boater on an iPad and they can go and navigate the Thousand Islands east of here, one of the most treacherous bodies of water. You cannot do that with one of our co competitor's tools. As they try to understand what the hell they're looking at, that feeling of fear is going to come back in. <laughs> Regarding the market, it's growing at 5% per year. There are 17 million registered recreational boats in the United States and Canada, and 95% of boats are unlikely to have onboard navigation systems. As a result, Boaters are looking to their pockets, they're looking to their phones, they're looking for the ways like solution on the water, and that's what we provide. How do we make money? We sell subscriptions at $20 per year or $4 per month. Our target revenue for our target growth for 2019 is 20K subscriptions, a little over 100,000 in 2020, and just under half a million in 2021. And what's gonna help fuel our growth in the 2020 and 2021 years is the integration of our software in with boat manufacturers. And the mechanism that we're going to be using has already been seen in the automotive industry. CarPlay and Android Auto are now quite commonplace. We are bringing this technology to the marine industry with a partnership that we've garnered with a major boat OEM manufacturer. 
Can't say exactly who that is right now, but it'll get announced in 2020, and we're very excited for what that's gonna do for us and the industry in general. How are we doing on the targets as of today? Uh, we have 3,700 paying users. 1,100 experiences have been shared to our map across Canada and the United States, which is our nautical chart coverage as of date. Uh, we have a 64% conversion ratio from our 14-day free trial to a paying subscription, which is quite high for the app industry, and we keep 90% of our customers. Some key wins from this past summer, summer we are promoted by Apple as one of the new apps they love. Nominate is the best new technology product at the Newport International Boat Show. And as already mentioned, we're going to be integrated into a major boat OEM supplier for 2020. So we'll be looking to take this to the next level. We are raising our seed round of $400,000. We've soft circled about 250 of that uh, to date. And that's to help us achieve our monthly recurring revenue target by the end of the summer of 35,000. With that, open the floor for questions. Uh, I was hoping you were going to help people rent their boats out to other people. <laughs> um, so, uh, what's your, uh, what's your, um, how many customers do you have today, like paying customers? 3,700. 3,700. And what has been the churn for the ones who have already converted over to the, to paying from the unpaid? Yeah. So... To date, we've mainly offered a monthly subscription and we keep 90%, so 10% so churn. To bounce on this question, how do you acquire your customer and what's the, what's the CAC? Yep, so our primary acquisition for that customer base was through Apple search ads. And our CAC on that, depending on the season, would range from $2 to $4. Okay. And what's the defensibility of this app? like? And you can say like it's just time on the market, I can't buy that as well, but do you have any, because I don't know, sure. I'm not an expert in that. Yep, so first up front, you need to get the licenses with the hydrographic services, okay. which is going through the government entities, so that's the biggest lead time to get the data sets. Um, not to say that someone else can't do that, the biggest defensibility is absolutely the community. So we're, unlike any other navigation software out there, we're very much doubling down on the community getting their engagement, getting their input, because that, that's ultimately our defensibility. So, non-technical guy with a technical question, but um, I get the, you acquire the maps, the maps are there on yep. the phone or on their GPS monitor screen or whatever. What if the boater doesn't have cell coverage? Does it just stop working or how's it work? Yeah, very good question. So what the maps will do is they'll cache to the phone. So once you load up the app and you're connected, it'll grab about a 30 kilometer radius, uh, perhaps more. And then if you go off cell service, the GPS functionality of the phone still works. Um, and one of the big applications that we design that for is we have a lot of customers along the St. Lawrence River and they don't want their cell service towers to be pinging over. So a lot of them will load up the app and then go on airplane mode and then navigate. So 90% retention in the winter months seems really high. So is that just like price testing, like sensitivity testing to determine that they're willing to just keep it going and not cancel and re-add? Yeah, what has like, been most successful is we created a yearly subscription. Sure. And that's, that's kept that retention rate a lot higher. So right. that yearly subscription, uh, those customers are staying and they're coming around to their first renewal. What's the breakdown between like the 3,700 paying between annual and monthly? There's 65% are yearly. What happens if someone actually does still break their propeller? <laughs> There's a, a very hefty terms of service at the start <laughs> is maybe the, the short answer. Um, but what we're classified as is a navigational aid. So like any of the other softwares out there, um, we are, we are an aid to navigation. We're not, uh, just stare at it and drive your boat sort of solution. Perfect. Thank you, Adam.
All right, folks, so now we're going to do a quick vote. That's the end of the pitches. Um, for those of you who have the little sheets underneath, do I have them here? Yes, I do. So you can point it here to, with your camera to get the voting. If you're on Android, you can use the URL at the bottom. I'm going to give you 48 seconds to do this, mostly for the Android people. You're, you're saying we need more Joe Cummins in this world? For the vote? <laughs> All right, folks, we have a winner. There were a lot of votes. What was the total number of votes at? One? 118. 118. Uh, the winner, RVZ. Very close, very close. Mike here? Will anyone here? If they're not here, well, we can recast it. Well, whose number? Yeah, come on up, just so everyone can give you. All right, that's it, folks. If you want to see the final, it will be June 11th at the NAC, as noted. So get your tickets. Uh, prices go up tonight, and I'll pass it back to Steve just to close things up.